Hi, I'm David Peña Guzman. And I'm Ellie Anderson. Welcome to Overthink. The podcast where two friends who are also professors put philosophy in dialogue with the everyday. Because big ideas are within everyone's reach. David, when's the last time you felt filled with rage? Exactly three days ago. Oh my God. <laughs> so recent. <laughs> yes. Um, I can even give you a timestamp for the experience <laughs> because it was when I was flying back from Paris to San Francisco and it was a male Karen on a plane sort of situation. So I boarded the plane and next to me sat this younger gentleman, a very tall, like six foot four white man wearing lots of bling, weirdly, which you never really see in a French guy. And he starts looking at his Instagram next to me and I'm like checking it out. Um, and he's looking at a lot of like rappers and women in bikinis. And uh -huh. I'm like, okay, cool. You're like, this is my kind of guy. Actually, the exact opposite. <laughs> <laughs> and in front of us sits this older gentleman and he must be like, late 70s, maybe uh, mid 80s. Oh, so we're talking old. Yeah, so he's an elderly person who then leans his seat back and crushes effectively the knees of my neighbor, this younger guy, who, like I said, is very tall and so his legs barely fit there. And the guy reaches out to the older man in front of him and says, you cannot do this. He can't put his seat back? Yeah, so he says, you may not do this. The problem is that the young guy is a Francophone who doesn't speak English, and the older man is an American guy who doesn't speak French. Oh, no. Well, okay, I also think part of the problem is the guy saying you may not do this, because I get that it's inconvenient when the person in front of you puts your seat back, but the airline has adjustable seats for a reason. Like, it's the man's right to put his seat back. Yeah, so I think we can have a whole debate about what is appropriate or not on airplanes. But <laughs> objectively speaking, he is so tall that his kneecaps were getting kind of crushed in by the seat being moved back, which doesn't happen to me as a five foot 11 guy. But I think he crossed that threshold of height mm -hmm. where it really was physically uncomfortable. So then the older man decides to put his seat back up straight to avoid the tension because he doesn't know what's going on. Mm hmm. He's like, I'm 80. I don't have yes. enough life to live for, <laughs> for this guy. The hill I die on. <laughs> yeah, not the hill or the seat that he wants to die I've on. I've seen some shit. I'm done. <laughs> so the older man is kind of smart and he waits until a flight attendant comes by, waits for her to look at him and then just yanks his seat back, crushing the guy's <laughs> legs again, oh thereby prompting a really angry response from this guy so the younger man and this was honestly horrifying grabs the seat of the older man and just shakes it super <gasps> intensely making the older man's head just like bounce oh my god uh, back and forth uh from the seat and so everybody around me starts like panicking and trying to intervene and i want to intervene but i don't speak french well enough to like talk about it on the spot. I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. what's the word for shake in French? I don't remember. Yeah, yeah. And I remember in that moment, I felt really angry that this guy used his physical force against this older man in a really unfettered way. I mean, it was genuinely a very violent act. And at the same moment that I'm feeling this anger, I'm realizing that I am projecting the same emotion as this guy who in a yeah. fit of rage lashes out against this poor man in front of him. And so it was a case of anger mirroring anger. Okay, I have thoughts about the anger component of this, but also I and probably our listeners are wondering what ended up happening. So then the flight attendant noticed this and got the younger man to move seats, but nobody actually got reprimanded. Okay. And that left me just fuming yeah for the rest of the 11 hour flight back to san francisco <laughs> <laughs> just stewing in your anger but i think that's such an interesting example david because i think anger flares up a lot in context of injustices or perceived injustices so i would argue that you felt angry at an injustice mm -hmm. and the male karen felt angry at a perceived injustice right 
I don't actually think it was unjust for the old man to put his seat back on the flight. It might not even have been unjust for him to sort of passive aggressively do it when the flight attendant was there. I think that's like probably within his rights. Oh, yeah, I agree. I was like, go man, crush this guy's kneecaps. But this guy sees it as an injustice, right? Which is why he responds with anger. And then you are actually seeing a real injustice. So there can be a response either to an injustice or a perceived injustice. But that seems to organize for me what Mm -hmm. the anger is. Well, now that you know what happened to me exactly three days ago in connection to this moment of anger, what's your relationship to this difficult emotion? (sighs) I think it's been a pretty organizing emotion in my life. I felt like my family system had a lot of injustice. And so I felt a lot of anger growing up. I felt a lot of anger directed towards me. And I had a lot of anger in response. And in fact, this like rage that I had as a child, I think is part of the reason I became a philosopher because I spent so much time stewing and trying to figure out like, well, is my anger justified? Is it not? Why do I feel this way? Like constantly journaling about it. (laughs) (laughs) And so I think it helped engage me as like, a budding, reflective thinker, especially around questions of justice and injustice. I like that you talk about anger as an emotion that initiated you in a way into philosophy, because the German philosopher Peter Schloterdijk wrote a book called Rage and Time, in which Hmm. he argues that rage or anger, he's talking about the Greek word tumos, which is a combination of like courage, anger, rage, just an intensity moving Hmm. forward. And he says that that emotion is in fact the affective state that inaugurates all Western literature and culture because it is the first emotion that is recorded in writing. So it has this founding power. And his evidence for this is the fact that the Iliad, which is one of the oldest works of Western literature, opens precisely with the rage of Achilles making Mm. this emotion the founding emotion of the West. So now I imagine you, Ellie, as like a microcosm of the West with (laughs) anger at the center of your personality structure. It's the organizing principle of your life. Don't tell my young self that. I I would have just really run with that. (laughs) (laughs) Today, we are talking about rage. This form of anger is often considered to be irrational or even immoral. But our guest, Maisha Cherry, argues that it can be transformative for social justice. How can rage help fight racism? And might rage, at least in some cases, actually make us better people? Contemporary philosopher Martha Nussbaum says that anger is irrational. And I think she has one of the most well-known articulations of anger that comes from our discipline. She says that we should never dwell in anger, but always try and transform it into something else. So anger on its own is not a helpful or moral emotion. Social life instead demands that we work through our anger. And that means stopping actually being angry. And I love that she uses ancient Greek tragedy to drive this particular point home, especially the Oresteia, which is a trilogy written by Aeschylus, which tells the story of the downfall of a very powerful family. The central character in the story is Orestes, who commits an unimaginable crime. He kills his mother, Clytemnestra, because she killed his father, i.e. her own husband, Agamemnon. After the crime... Orestes is on the run, and the Furies are after him. And the Furies are these hideous mythical creatures that represent effectively revenge. And when he's running away, Athena looks at the situation and decides that she needs to adjudicate this tension between the Furies and Orestes through judicial process. And there's a trial to see whether Orestes should be punished or not for killing his mother. Orestes wins the trial. And the Furies are, well, furious. (laughs) But then Athena in the story convinces the Furies to stay with her in Athens and actually join her endeavor to administer justice in the city by means of legal process. And in her book on anger, Nussbaum says that when they agree to join Athena, 
the Furies undergo a radical transformation. And you can see this in the description in the tragedy. They change their look, their behavior, and then they suddenly start donning what Nussbaum calls benevolent sentiments, which Nussbaum then interprets as evidence that law and order and peace require the abandonment of the Furies or of unbridled anger. Yeah, because it's not the abandonment of the Furies, it's the transformation of the Furies, the abandonment of... Of what they represent. Yeah, and so I think that kind of founding moment of ancient Greek tragedy where we are seeing the transformation of anger provides a really nice symbol for subsequent approaches to anger as well. The anger of Martin Luther King Jr. at the racism in the United States was transformed into a nonviolent approach to social justice, similar to that of Gandhi. And these are actually examples that Nussbaum uses of people who transform their anger into love and compassion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I like that she's never saying that we should not feel anger, but simply that we need to learn to metabolize it into other more positive emotions, such as compassion or even grief. She says that when we feel angry at a situation, you know, like somebody crushes your knees in the plane, what you should do instead of dwelling in that emotion is just grieve the fact mm. that the situation happened in the first place. Mm -hmm, and so mm -hmm. the feeling is understandable, but the dwelling in it that brewing or stewing, that's the problem. And I think the idea that dwelling in anger is immoral is something you find in a number of other traditions. It's something that comes up a lot in Buddhist philosophy, where there are debates about whether anger should be eliminated entirely or transformed or metabolized, to use the word that you mentioned from Nussbaum, into something else. So the idea that anger has to be eliminated because it doesn't serve a moral purpose at all is associated with the 8th century philosopher Shanti Deva. He says that when we feel angry, we should be like a block of wood trying to shut down the feeling of anger. So this is more or less the view that we just shouldn't give in to anger, this tradition of elimination. And a lot of people have assumed that this is really the main, if not only, Buddhist view on anger. But the tantric Buddhist tradition of Tibet actually suggests something very different, which is that anger can be virtuous. And the contemporary philosopher Emily McRae shows this using two Tibetan texts that have absolutely incredible titles. They're from the 10th <laughs> century, but their names are the wheel weapon that strikes at the enemy's vital spot. Oh, my God. <laughs> and the poison destroying peacock mind training. Like those are some metal names for 10th century monastic texts. <laughs> yes, poison destroying and wheel weapon. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> no. And there's also a lot of Tibetan Buddhist iconography that shows like scary deities with flaming eyeballs and weapons. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of anger there, or at least what appears to be anger, because part of McRae's point is that, sure, Buddhist philosophy doesn't license just the compulsive acting upon angry emotion. Mm -hmm. However, the tantric tradition of Tibetan Buddhism suggests a specific kind of anger, which she calls tantric anger. And that's anger that's been metabolized through meditative and contemplative practices. So it actually sounds pretty similar to Nussbaum's view, although McRae still says it's anger, whereas Nussbaum says it's transformed from anger into something else. But unlike regular anger, tantric anger is not compulsive. So one can drop it as soon as it's not needed. It has this effective quality for moral transformation, according to McRae. But the moral agent is not attached to it the way that most of us are when we just have a knee-jerk reaction of anger. So with this notion of tantric anger, let me ask you a question. Is it that the anger subsides and loses intensity? Or is it simply that we have more control over it on account of these meditative and contemplative practices so that I can then use it if I want to or not use it if I don't want to? It's more the latter. It's this okay. idea that we have, as McRae calls it, an upper hand on our anger. And ultimately, that actually does mean, though, that we can choose the intensity with which we feel anger through cultivating spiritual practices of meditation and contemplation. Mm -hmm. We not only have the upper hand on feeling anger at all, but we also have the upper hand on how strongly we can feel it. 
Okay, and so that is really different than Nussbaum's yeah. claim, which mm-hmm. is that the metabolizing process has to yield a final product that doesn't look anything like the original ingredients, right? So like the yeah. compassion, or she uses the term love a lot, the love that we feel or the grief even that we feel as a result of an anger-inducing situation will never have any of the qualities of anger or rage. So it disappears right. completely ideally. Yeah, and that actually is also a very mainstream view in Buddhist ethics. It's just that McRae's point is that that's not the whole story. People often assume that the only way to treat anger in Buddhist thought is by transforming it into compassion or equanimity. Mm-hmm. But she's like, no, these tantric deities with their flaming eyeballs, <laughs> the peacock mind training, <laughs> we can metabolize it and it will still be anger, just of a different sort. Yeah, so anger becomes a weapon that you use to strike at the enemy's vital spot. Exactly. A real (laughs) weapon, to be specific. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and the thing about Nussbaum is that at heart, she is an Aristotelian. And that means that she follows Aristotle in thinking that anger is at its core a desire for revenge. Mm -hmm. And so if the goal of social life, as we saw in the Oresteia, is to get rid of anger and transform it into another emotion... It means that at the individual and at the collective level, we need to figure out ways to move away from expressions of anger. And the reason for that is that we need to move away from ways of seeking revenge. Correct. And so individually, you can easily see how that can be the case. You know, you don't want to go around your life seeking revenge from those who have hurt you because ultimately that just hurts you. Um, okay. I think Inigo Montoya from The Princess Bride would disagree, but that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> but that's why uh, Nussbaum says that anger is ultimately futile because mm-hmm. you will just lose yourself in this wild goose chase. But at the collective level, Nussbaum says... This means changing the way we approach justice and especially criminal justice. Hmm. And she cites the research of the psychologist Richard H. Taylor, who won the Nobel Prize in economics in 2017, for showing that positive reinforcement is much better at getting people to change their ways and to grow than negative reinforcement or punishment, essentially. So the criminal justice system, as it currently is structured, is rooted in anger, or at least the desire for revenge, but that's wrongheaded in the same way that my anger directed towards another person is wrong? Yes, and this is why it's called uh, retributive justice, Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. because we are trying to get the criminal to pay back for the offense that they carried out against the victim by ourselves inflicting a kind of punishment toward them. And in connection to this question of criminal justice, she points to a a series of experiments in what is known as restorative justice that indicate that the best way to combat recidivism is not through punishment, through taking away people's freedom, through isolation, but rather through things like education, training, therapy, community building, and so on. So if mm. you want to change criminals, really you should not act in anger as a community. Okay. Our guest is definitely going to disagree with that, which I'm excited about. (laughs) Before we get to that, I want to think about one other aspect maybe of rage, which Maisha Cherry, our guest, uses as a synonym for anger. So Mm -hmm. you probably noticed that we've been using rage and anger both. Yes, Rage is typically seen as a particularly intense or even violent form of anger, but it's a form of anger. But I think our discussion so far has revolved around anger as ethically oriented, as either moral or immoral, or even if it's not moral or immoral itself, as leading to moral or immoral action. And I think this is true of most philosophical discussions of anger, and it will certainly be the way that our interview with Maisha goes as well. But I also want to just briefly mention a psychological approach to anger that we get through the affect theory of Sylvan Tompkins. And just as a way of setting that up, like, I often feel super angry when I'm stuck at a light and there's a red (laughs) left turn arrow, but the light is green and nobody is coming the other way. And I'm just like, dude, let me turn left, please. Don't make me sit out this entire light because there's this arbitrary (laughs) red left turn arrow. And that's not anger directed towards a person, but it's just like kind of a 
general frustration. I don't know, David, do you have this too? <laughs> well, yeah, when I told the story about this incident on the flight, you know, I said I was angry at the guy who was angry at the older man, but yeah. I also was angry at my own inability in the moment to speak French. And that was not really directed <laughs> at anybody, not even at myself. It was just an anger inducing fact of my reality in that moment. But I think this speaks to the limits of one claim that Aristotle makes about anger, which is that anger is always directed at another person. And you just mentioned the American psychologist Sylvan Tompkins, who talks a lot about anger that is not directed at other subjects. And he came to his theory of anger by observing preverbal infants. And he says that when infants, we're talking about very young infants, first year of life, when they feel overstimulated, maybe because there is a loud noise somewhere in their environment, they don't know what to do and they experience what he called distress. But if the stimulus does not abate, at some point the infant will cross a threshold and pass from distress to full-blown anger, which for Tonkins mm. is an innate primal affect that doesn't need to be conscious, it doesn't even need to be cognitive, and therefore is not even directed at a particular entity, let alone a person. The, the infant is just pissed um, <laughs> because there is this overstimulation of the senses. Yeah. Well, and I think that speaks to a kind of way that anger can be a response to just a feeling of overwhelm, at least that is my experience of it in some cases and definitely resonates with the experiences, I think, in my family system where anger was just licensed as like a way you respond if you're feeling anxious or overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. Well, let's turn to our interview. We'll hear from Aisha after the break. Well, we're very excited to have with us Maisha Cherry, who is an assistant professor of philosophy at UC Riverside. She specializes in moral psychology as well as social and political theory. And she's the author of an amazing book entitled The Case for Rage, Why Anger is Essential to Anti-Racist Struggle. She's also the host of the Unmute podcast, which Ellie and I cannot recommend highly enough. We are so delighted to introduce our guest for today, Dr. Maisha Cherry. So welcome, Maisha. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited. Okay, my voice doesn't sound like an excited voice. So maybe <laughs> I really am excited. <laughs> Although the tone was monotone, I really am excited. Okay, thank you. We're very excited too, which I think my voice is probably like sharing too much. But in any case, on to like a more sober professorial vibe. So you, contrary to popular opinion, have articulated the view that we need to give rage credit for its ability to catalyze social justice movements. And you draw inspiration from Black feminist author and poet Audre Lorde, who wrote the seminal essay, The Uses of Anger, Women Responding to Racism. And you use her writings to show that even though most expressions of anger are politically futile, there's one kind of rage that can transform our attitudes for the sake of a better world. And you call this Lordian rage. What is it about Lordian rage that has this transformative power for you? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you kind of mentioned the uses of anger essay, because when I was deciding to get into the, the topic as an intellectual endeavor, I was reading a lot of feminist philosophy, and I noticed that the philosopher was quoting this woman that I hadn't heard of, um, mm. and it seemed to be the, the source that, that they all had in common. And so it was the first time that I had heard of Audre Lorde. So basically, I got put on to Audre Lorde by white feminist philosophers. Who would have thought? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I basically go to the archive, a.k.a. JSTOR, and I, I find, I find the, the essay. And I'm just amazed about the essay. I mean, she is indeed responding to racism that she's encountering, that she shares between political allies, political allies and feminist movement. Um, and she starts the essay kind of giving a definition of racism and suggesting that her anger is in response to it. She's given an account of a kind of anger that is appropriate, that is that is fitting, uh, how it can be a catalyst for change, how it can be an inclusive. And it was just something about that essay that just really, it moved me in a very, in a very unique way. I mean, I'm not typically moved um, when I'm doing intellectual readings, um, but that, that essay moved me. You know, I'm very much in the emotions. And so 
I listen to my emotions and I'm, I listen to the things that move me. And, and since that moment, I've been kind of, one might say, intellectually in love with, with Audre Lorde. And so when I was thinking about the topic, I had to give respect to where respect was due. And, and I think, I think as, as much as there's a lot of things that I talk about in the book that does not necessarily derive from the uses of, of anger essay, it is mostly inspired by it. And so when I, when I consider Lordy and Rage, I had to name it Lordy and Rage, which is an anti-racist anger. That essay changed my thinking about what anger can be in the context of racial injustice, not necessarily from the mouth of a man, a masculine man, militant man in the nationalist movement, but from a feminist woman um, who was very inclusive and wasn't just concerned about herself as a privileged uh, Black woman. And when I think about anger that can arise in the context of political injustice, one of the things that I began to realize over the years is that critics was painting anger in broad strokes. I think they, they looked at anger as if it was one thing and that one thing was always destructive, always counterproductive, that when mm-hmm. we experienced it, we was under its control and, and all hell can break loose. But that's not what I found in the essay of, of Audre Lorde. And so what I began to do is, is try to philosophically approach that essay and try to figure out, you know, what, what, is, what is it about this anger that differs from the criticism that I'm hearing in these streets? <laughs> like, what, is it, what is it about this anger? And I, and I realized that it has several features. So, so loading and rage, this anti-racist anger, it's targeted towards racism, races, racist attitudes, et cetera. So its target is, is a specific mm-hmm. target. It's directed at something very specific. It's, it's motivational. And so it motivates one to engage in, engage in productive action. Is directed at, at change, and Algelo is very specific with suggesting that it's a radical transformation of our world, that when one is angry at a particular racial injustice, one is not only thinking about oneself and one's social economic position, one is concerned about everyone. So it's inclusive as what I call mm. an inclusive perspective. So I'm not just angry that my people got pulled over by the police, <laughs> mm-hmm. but I'm also angry that Asian Americans are getting attacked in the streets, right? That's Lordy and rage. It has an inclusive perspective because I realize that I'm not free until everyone is free. And you contrast that with destructive anger, like, you know, January the 6th, what happened on the Capitol. Yeah. I mean, they're not really aiming to really bring about a radical transformation of our world. They're, they're aiming to undo the democratic process. It's not inclusive, right? It's, it's only thinking about uh, white folks and particularly them thinking that they have been excluded in the American system. And so when you, when you consider those features that Audre Lorde has helped me to illuminate, you realize that there is kind of a, a productive and, and an appropriate rage that can be useful in the context of political injustice that doesn't always necessarily lead to January 6th or Charlottesville. Mm-hmm. And so I think, I think more critics, anger critics are right to be suspect about anger, but be suspect about that kind of anger and not lordy and rage. It's different from anger that I call narcissistic. It's different from anger that I call white rage or mm-hmm. rogue rage. It's different from that. So let's, mm-hmm. let's, let's attack that and challenge people to perhaps transition out of those unproductive rage and come into lordy and rage. But let's, let's keep lordy and rage. It has, it has uses. Mm-hmm. Well, one thing that I really like about your book, Maisha, is the way in which you draw these distinctions between destructive forms and expressions of anger, like the narcissistic anger or the anger that only seeks gratification from taking others down and destroying the social fabric, and then this constructive, productive, Lordian rage that seeks to build communities and that seeks to empower individuals rather than disempower them. But uh, speaking about being moved by writing, um, I, w- I was moved by one particular point that you make. Just one? Damn. No, I'm just lying. 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 <laughs> yes. Let me rephrase that. I was particularly uh, moved by <laughs> by an argument that you make in chapter two of your book, which is that even Lordian rage, in spite of its transformative power, can sometimes go wrong. And that's a move that I wasn't right. expecting because by mm-hmm. then you had set up this distinction right between constructive and destructive rage. And you point out that well-meaning people who end up being so consumed in, let's say, fighting what they're angry about, uh, in particular racism, so they, they are embodying Lordian rage, but they might end up actually neglecting their relationships with, with other people, with their loved ones, with their family members, ignoring their their duties in their everyday lives. And I want to know whether you can tell us more about how maybe incessantly fighting against what makes us justifiably angry can still end up making us sometimes act in unethical ways. Right, right. So this gets to kind of the the heart of the matter when I think about kind of my philosophy of philosophy of emotions. And so I kind of pointed out uh, about action and agency. And I think I think as much as emotions can move us, 
uh, we're still we're still in the driver's seat here. You know, we're not possessed. Mm -hmm. You know, we're still in the driver's seat. So I want to I want to give an account that no matter what emotion you may experience, that there's still room for agency. Then in a non-ideal context with my agency, I can be working so hard with something that is conceptually very productive to the point that I'm overworking myself. And so the anger can be fitting in that sense. Um, but it can turn what we call kind of prudentially inappropriate, right? In which I'm neglecting my own well-being, right? I'm mm. driving myself insane. Mm. And, and, and sociologists and psychologists have recently talked about this, what we call kind of racial fatigue. Um, mm -hmm, people get mm -hmm. tired of fighting a good fight. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's also a recent literature about self-care. And so I, I want to suggest uh, that just because I find power in anger, I'm not suggesting that we ought to be angry at every turn, angry to the you know top degree, always working, always in the space of being motivated to do something about injustice because we got to take care of ourselves. And when we don't take care of ourselves, even in the name of the struggle, our anger can be going wrong in that particular way. And that's why I end the book with a chapter talking about anger management, mm -hmm. right? Suggesting yeah. that, hey, if you want to keep this anger productive, if you want to continue to resist races and racial rules, here are some things that you constantly, you need to constantly do in order to make sure that that anger stays in its most potent form, right? That's agency, right? This is suggesting that there's things that we can do. So yes, we are equipped with a tool, but we are the ones <laughs> uh, that are maneuvering it and we can overdo it and do it in very ways that can be counterproductive to our particular aims. And I think once we recognize that, um, we can be hold ourselves a little bit more accountable, hold each other a little bit more, more accountable and allow us to kind of take care of each other, take care of ourselves, make sure that when someone is doing something out of control, we check them in solidarity. And we also make sure that we constantly check ourselves. It also allows us to be humble that even though we are experiencing this kind of productive and fitting anger, doesn't necessarily mean that we're always going to be perfect, that we're always going to weld it in ways that are in line with our explicit goals. And that's why before I get to anger management, I talk about rage renegades, mm -hmm. right? I talk about how white allies can even misuse this, this rage. So I want to allow for agency. And just because you got it <laughs> uh, doesn't mean that you can't go wrong with it. And, and I think we need to be we, we're aware of that. Yeah. And I think what you're saying speaks a lot to the rise of attention to self-care and um, sort of having those inward turns where we're seeking refuge from uh, the kind of, as you said, battle fatigue or racial battle fatigue of uh, fighting for justice. And I guess I'm wondering how you see that in relation to the idea of metabolizing anger, because you say in your book that lordy and rage is a metabolized anger. And that's something that comes up in some other accounts of anger as well, where on the one hand, you have the account of somebody like Martha Nussbaum or Shanti Deva, whom you also mentioned in your book, who both think that we have to move beyond anger. So anger could be a starting point, but it ultimately has to be extinguished or overcome in order for us to have a moral contribution to justice. And then something like maybe Lordian rage, where the metabolized anger is still actually an anger. And that's something that you see also in the tantric Buddhist tradition where you're kind of holding on <laughs> to your anger, but you have control over it. So I guess in thinking about what what it might look like to have that anger management. Do you see metabolizing anger as ultimately a form of overcoming it or as preserving it, but just in a different way? Yeah, it's the latter for me. It's, mm -hmm. the, it's the latter for me. You know, I was very convinced, uh, did an anthology prior to the book in 2018 called The More Psychology of Anger and, and yeah. got some brilliant folk to contribute. Highly recommend. Some essays <laughs> on, on anger. And so I basically suggest I don't believe in transitional anger. I believe in transformative anger. I think, you know, the kind of anger that I'm giving an account of, it's all good all by itself. Mm -hmm. Right. So so why do we need to leave it in order to in, in, enter into kind of a new emotional space if it aims to, to challenge and to change and bring about a radical transformation of our world, if it ascribes value to marginalized people's lives, is it motivate us and give us the fuel that we need to engage in productive action? If we're able to have it and be a resistant figure, why would I want to transition out of that? Mm -hmm. Right. But I would say, I would say something about mm -hmm. other emotions. And, and, and another reason why I don't think that we need to leave anger to enter into other kind of emotional spaces is because I believe that anger is already compatible with those emotions. So why yeah. would I want to leave it? And not only is it compatible, it's also an expression of it. If I'm going to be angry that someone is, is being oppressed and, and out of that anger, you know, I basically bring about an awareness that an injustice has happened. And I basically also make a claim about the value of their lives. I can only do that when I love them. 
And I'm talking about the kind of agape mm. love, the kind of attitudinal love that King talks about, right? I mean, it basically means I love black folk. It means that I love oppressed, marginalized folk, right? It mm-hmm. means that I love Latinx folk. That's compatible. That means that love is compatible. And it also means that that anger is an expression of that particular love. So much so that if you ever got, got abused and your friends did not get angry, you would doubt <laughs> the feelings that they have for you. I mean, at least I would, right? Because yeah. that's what that's the power. So I don't think we need to transition out of anger to experience that love. And this is very different from Nussbaum's argument because she believes that we that we should. And and she she uses King as an example, particularly I have a dream speech, as an example of a transition out of anger into love. But when I look at King's life, uh, King's life is a model of the fact that he did not transition out of his anger, right? Mm-hmm. He found it to be transformative. And so, mm. you know, you, you think about the letter from a Birmingham jail, which a lot of us uh, teach in our, in our philosophy classes. And, you know, we, we basically hail it as a, a good piece of philosophical writing, but we don't give the full account of how that even came about. So he's in jail. His lawyer basically sends him a letter that white clergymen, uh, moderate white clergymen have wrote. It's an open letter telling them to wait, be patient, they're starting trouble, et cetera, et cetera. And his lawyer basically gives an account and describes King as being angry. <laughs> I mean, like really mad as hell. And so mm. what King does in jail is he's sort of reading that, that letter out of anger. He writes letter from a Birmingham jail from scraps in the jail. So we have this wonderful piece of philosophical writing that was birthed out of anger. Why would I want King to transition <laughs> out of that? <laughs> Look what we got as a result, right? And and when we see when we see King even mention the anger, there's a this is found in a collection um, that Cornell West did on the radical called the Radical King. There's an essay on the boys that that King writes about, and mind you, he's writing this during the rise of the Black Panther movement and there's riots happening, you would think that he would tell young folk, don't be angry, right? He doesn't. He basically says that your anger is immature, right? Mm. And he basically says, won't you come? Basically, he says, it's like that old, for those who 90s baby, come on and join Death Row. He's basically telling them, <laughs> if you join it, come on over here, join our team, and use that anger in productive ways. Because we got a plan. And he suggests that W. Du Bois was a model mm. of that kind of transformative anger. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm just not convinced that we need transition out of it. Right. And when we think about King, we think about all these positive emotions. He didn't find a disconnect between the two. He was able to see that that you can have have them all. And that's my view. You don't need to transition out of it. It's already transformative all by itself. And it's compatible with these other positive emotions. Yeah. And that sort of sanitized version of King is like, oh, just (laughs) about love. I think I think that's like that's like the white version of King. That's the version of King that's friendly to middle and upper middle class white folks who want to have their cake and eat it, too. In 2021, because it still wasn't friendly. It was 2022. (laughs) Jesus. Can y'all believe it? Anyway, because during that time, people weren't trying to hear it. But yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, totally. Now, in retrospect, <laughs> oh, he was such a nice figure, I think, because there's still a lot of, you know, white resistance to black anger as having transformative right. power. Yeah. And I, I'm i thinking about this definition that you're giving us of anger, not as something that is opposed to positive emotions, but as something that can grow out of and in fact, manifest positive emotions mm. like love, hope, yearning for another future. And This raises actually a question for me about the argument that you make in connection to rage in your book, because here it seems like we ought to be angry at things that produce injustice, at things that produce suffering in the world. But at one point in your book, you make the argument that you actually cannot tell somebody that they should or should not be angry. It's not as if emotions are just hats that we decide to put on arbitrarily, like, Mm -hmm. you know, in in the spot. But yet we often hear activists say things like, we should be angrier about X, Y, or Z. And that appeal doesn't strike me as necessarily misguided since it, it really has normative weight behind it, right? So when somebody says, David, you should be angrier at I don't know, the disenfranchisement of a particular community, I take that to be a productive critique of my values, of my action, of my priorities. And so I want to hear your thoughts about this, about the claim, you ought to be angry or you ought not to be angry. Yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, it's interesting kind of thinking about these things, because on one level, I really did have to think about kind of common language uses and what we mean by them in non-ideal circumstances daily. 
I didn't think about like a larger kind of view about what I take emotions to be in general that can apply across all cases and all contexts. You hit it spot on about what I think about emotions. And I just think that like, I can't will myself into, into an emotion. Now, I can create a context or kind of things to kind of lead me into it. So if I want it to be sad, mm-hmm. trust me, I can just go to the news and just watch mm-hmm. a whole bunch of stuff. And it may be a probability that as a result, I will become sad. So I can, you know, put myself into a situation that will lead me into sadness, but it still doesn't guarantee that I will be, right? Which goes to show that there's limits to this, right? For a whole bunch of reasons. It goes back to kind of, agency and, and just how the emotions work in general. And also, I would say that I have always been turned off by, I mean, think about the kind of position that I'm in, about when I'm hearing people say, don't be angry. Mm-hmm. And in some ways, I'm, res- I'm resistant to that. And I have to be consistent. So if I'm consistent with, there's something appalling about someone telling me not to be angry. Mm. I have to also be consistent and say, well, there's also something off. It really is something off about someone telling me that I should be angry. Now, what is that about? I think both of those things are about what I take emotions to be. We just can't will ourselves into these emotional states. Now, we can hold ourselves accountable about attitudes um, and certain kinds of beliefs, right? So let's just say that I'm never angry about injustice. And this is something that Amir Srinivasan kind of, kind of notes. She talks about how people say, well, the Dalai Lama doesn't get angry about injustice, but it would be kind of off for us to say that he does. he's not concerned about injustice. Like that's a, kind of like a counter argument. And she like kinds of agree. And she's like, well, the typical person who doesn't, we would still say that there's something missing, although what's missing, we can't really give an account of, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of sensitive to that. I don't know what's missing in that particular case. Can't really give an account of it. But I would say that even if the emotion is not there, I will expect at least minimally to hold them responsible for any kind of lack of judgment. So it could be the case that like, you're not angry at this particular injustice. Well, what is anger? Anger, it, it involves kind of a judgment that something has gone awry and suggesting that something needs to be changed. And as much as I like for that person to have kind of this, you know, kind of additional emotional thing, I, I'm still resistant with saying that they should feel the emotion that I have, right? I'm more concerned as long as they have the, the values and the beliefs, because I think they can still have the values and beliefs. Emotions is just a way of valuing, but it's not the only way of valuing, mm-hmm. right? Hmm. I also want to be very careful about predispositions. And so there's just some people who are just dispositionally have very different emotional tendencies than others. So I know people who just don't get angry. It takes a lot to get them angry. Me? <laughs> Anything gets me. <laughs> I know. I noticed when I told you only one thing moved me in your book. Listen, listen. Any, I don't care if I feel the stereotype of the angry black woman. And here's the thing. People probably wouldn't even know that I'm angry. Uh, but, but there's a lot to get me indignant, right? Mm-hmm. But that's just, you know, it's just, it's just me. It, you know, I just take it to be kind of me and my history and my experiences and my kind of dispositions, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. I know a lot of people who just have a disposition to be sad. I'm rarely sad. Right, which is different. And then not to even give an account of people who, whether that's through uh, the way that their brains are structured, they're just not predisposed to certain kinds of emotions. I want to be kind of sensitive mm-hmm. to that kind of thing, whether the, it's through uh, hormonal imbalances or whether it's just who people are. People just respond very differently emotionally. So the should or should not, when it comes to the domain of emotions, I want to be resistant to that. I'm content with people you know, having certain kinds of values and beliefs, absence of those particular emotions. But I am concerned about people who are in fact angry. And if you are already angry, this book is for you. <laughs> Listen to me, <laughs> right? I'm concerned about people who are angry and people are being uh, made to, you know, make them feel embarrassed or shameful um, that they are angry. This book is not to convert people into angry people, right? I am concerned about people who've been having anger at, at, at racism and have been made to feel that they're doing something wrong. In some ways, I want to remind them because I think there's some things there. I don't think they need a philosopher to tell them how valuable their anger is. But I want to remind them about how valuable their anger is and they shouldn't get rid of it. Mm -hmm. And I also want to talk to people who are not interested in feeling any emotion, right? They are just mad that other people are mad. Well, I want to talk to those critics and let them know, hey, you need to relax because the kind of anger that they are experiencing is productive. And hence why I don't believe in the should and should not kind of kind of thing. Yeah. If you already are, that's where I want to start the argument. Well, and this makes me think of another argument that you have in the book, which is that there is a pretty significant asymmetry when it comes to, let's say, white people and people of color in relation to these claims of whether you ought to or ought not to be angry. So, you know, it's Hmm. not the same thing to look at a white person looking at a racialized situation and say, you should be angrier and to look at a black person who doesn't display that anger and then telling them, according to me, you should be responding to racism as a black person 
in a way that is legible to me. And in this case, that means being angrier. And you point out that not expressing anger, especially for people of color, can be a survival mechanism after having to deal with the realities of racism. And so the violence sometimes maybe even of that injunction to be angry uh, has to take into consideration this asymmetry of the who it's being addressed to, who the addressee is. As much as it's a concise book, and there's a lot going on there that I'm, I'm trying to make into kind of succinct things. And, and one of the things that I, um, I'm aware of and, and, and why I'm so interested in kind of solving some of these problems, these real world problems, is because I think there's a lot of policing going on, no doubt. Tone policing, anger policing that's happening in our, in our era, like never before, particularly because we have so many mediums to do that. And the policing, it can take a variety of forms. And that's why, once again, I'm resistant to the should and should not. I mean, in some ways, that could be a form of policing. I don't think anybody should police the emotions of others. Now, of course, there's going to be some exceptions to that. If we're going to do some should, should not, I want to say that people should not be policing the emotions, the emotions of others. I mean, one of the things that I'm, I, I talk about in the book is for you to say that I should be angrier. You know, I, I, I say in the ch second chapter of the book, I believe, that I think proportionality to me is just irrelevant. Um, and so even that kind of policing that says, hey, you should be angrier, you know, particularly for a black person. It's like, listen, man, if I'm one more ounce of angry, I will lose my mind. The reason why I think policing goes awry is because we try to make these general pronouncements and not really attuned mm -hmm. to kind of the individual and the needs of the individual. And that's why I just don't think that it works in either way. So we have to be very careful about that. You know, I don't believe that everybody should be angry. But I want people to be angry. I do want white people to be angry about injustice. Not all white people. When I saw the protests in 2020 and I saw, you know, Portland and, and even internationally people walking in solidarity with black lives, I can't really describe how I felt. There's no doubt that I felt affirmed. I felt seen. And so there is some value. I mean, we want to go to the shoulds. Should some white people be angry? Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want some white people to be angry, but I still want to be resistant to the all claim and still want us to be very sensitive on an individual level. And then, you know, I want some white people to be angry because I want to take a break. I mean, we mentioned this before. I want to be able to take a break. I want to be able to tone it down just a little bit for the sake of my survival. Also, there's some contexts in which white people can be angry in ways in which I cannot be, particularly with the stereotypes. In some certain contexts, I may be afraid that I'm going to confirm the stereotype, which I probably have already had in this interview, um, <laughs> that black women are angry all the time, right? And so oh. this is not the day I want to confirm the, you know, yeah. oh, can you be angry? Yeah. Can you like turn it up a little bit? in this meeting today, <laughs> not today. I want to be quiet today, right? So there's some value, there's some value in that. And I think, you know, in terms of white rage, I want to return to the white nationalist. Well, I don't, okay, I don't want to return to the white nationalist, but <laughs> I am, I'm, I'm inclined to think a little bit more about what you said earlier about the fundamental difference between Lordy and rage and the rage of the white nationalist. Because, you know, as you're talking about wanting white people to be angry about racism, I'm also thinking about how I want white people not to be angry about <laughs> what they perceive as like racism against white right. people. And so following your point that... We can't say to the white nationalist, you shouldn't be angry because that's going to be ineffective and perhaps misguided. I wonder what we should say to them, because I think you've given us some really interesting tools for thinking about that. One of them being that the white nationalist is not actually invested in the well-being of all people, but they're mm -hmm. only invested in the well-being of white people. But I sometimes worry that they don't properly recognize that. And I'm thinking about an interview that the British journalist Gary Young did with Richard Spencer, where Richard Spencer was just like, oh, no, 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 I literally want the well-being of all. I just think that white supremacy is the best way to achieve that. It's a contradiction. That's a contradiction. Yeah, but go yeah, ahead. So <laughs> what is, no, no, that's, that's, what, that's what I want your thoughts on. Like, how do we alert them to that contradiction. So let me just say this. When it comes to the white nationalists, we got to ask some questions here. Like, what is your anger directed at? Right? I, I really don't know. Um, and maybe we can think through this together because I think that's going to answer a lot of questions, right? Yeah. For one, it's going to let us know, is that really injustice really a thing or is that an imagining? And if it's not the case that it's a thing, then perhaps we can persuade them that it's not a thing and there's no need to be angry, right? Because it will mm -hmm. be unfitting at that point, right? Mm -hmm. If it is a thing, is it a symptom of a thing? Is there really a larger cause here, right? So, so listen, we know it's not the case that other racial groups are taking over this country. 
even even if you're concerned about numbers, we know that numbers do not make the majority. Power doesn't work in that particular way. Yeah. We know that we still live in a white supremacist society. We know that there's still such thing as white power. I mean, have you looked at the Senate lately? White people are still in political power, even when there's a majority of, of people of color. I mean, it's just not the case that other racial groups are taking over. So what are you going to do with that particular fact, right? If you say, hey, no need to go through other, other features, what you say that you're angry about is just not fitting. You have no reason to be angry. And in some ways, we perhaps stop the conversation or we moved on to something else because the issue is no longer analyzing your anger. Yeah. But it's analyzing what you uh, mistakenly have assumed the world to be. Of, of course, a philosopher is going to answer your question, Ellie, by mm. suggesting that there need to be kind of a Socratic <laughs> uh, kind of engagement. And that's basically where it's going to start. I even think the whole term white nationalist within itself, I mean, the term itself lets us know what the values are, right? And yeah. unless that person mm -hmm. is able to transition out of those values, we can never really get to a productive kind of rate that will benefit everybody that lives in a liberal democracy, right? So we already know that there's already, I don't know if we want to say that there's some self-deception involved there or there's some other kind of cognitive things going on that allow them to see. I think white nationalist is a clear case that there are some explicit values, some explicit beliefs that doesn't hold up on a scrutiny when we look at it empirically. I think the more, the more kind of difficult cases is people who was at the Capitol who doesn't really consider themselves a white nationalist per se, or not part mm. of any nationalist organizations, but they were there anyway. And so I will be interested in kind of interviewing them and trying to figure out, okay, what were you angry at? Right. I think that's a, that's a very interesting case um, that would be very different from the R Richard Spencer case. And once again, I think I think my account will help to kind of make sense of, of for them and also for ourselves is that when we begin to ask them, what are the features of their rage? Right. Really get at the content. Right. Those features. Who are you thinking about? What is it directed at? What do you aim to do? Then we're able to figure out what kind of rage a person actually have. Um, and we can expose them to say, hey, this is the epistemic errors you're making. Here are some moral errors that you're making. Do you want to stay here? Do you want to change your values? Uh, do you want to change your beliefs? You know, I got some ways for it to happen, but unless you're willing to do that, then we're not really going to get to the productive stuff. Yeah. And I think that's a really powerful way of thinking about it because one of the things I really like about your account is that it doesn't actually depend on changing their anger, right? So a lot of psychological right. studies show it's really hard to change your emotions in the face of evidence that shows that you're wrong about what you think is a fitting anger. But your right. point is instead that, well, maybe they can change their values and beliefs, seeing that their anger is not the kind of lordy and rage that you're discussing and therefore not productive. Right, right. And it's not an instant. I'm not saying, as we know with Socrates, when he encountered these individuals, sometimes they left the conversation. I mean, his, his success rate is pretty low. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I'm not saying in that Socratic interaction that immediately that person is going to transition. He does not use evidence-based teaching methods. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not going to say it's going to happen in that instance, but we also didn't come into an anti-racist uh, lifestyle in the instant either, mm -hmm. right? So as much as we have been generous and our, and our wokeness have been a process, I, I think we need to be a little bit more generous in that regard. But it doesn't mean that we don't hold them accountable. It doesn't mean that we don't engage in conversation in that particular way or ask them to engage in any kind of self-reflection, et cetera, et cetera. Just know that there's just like we require work, they too require work too. Yeah, and uh, we all <laughs> require work um, around yeah. this question of how to process our emotions, especially as you said earlier, in the unideal world that we inhabit. With that in mind, Maisha, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been an extremely productive and let's hope transformative conversation. <laughs> thank you thank, thank you, you so much. thank you so much i really enjoyed it thanks so much enjoying this episode please rate and review us on apple podcasts spotify or wherever you listen to your podcasts you can also connect with us and other listeners on facebook and instagram Wow, David, so much to think about. I always love talking to Maisha, and it's been so great to have her on. So what did you think? I thought it was amazing. You know, I obviously read her book, um, but listening to her talk about it gives me a sense of what she means when she says that she wants to build the case for rage, especially for those who are already angry. Totally. Well, and also just speaking of her book, I mean... Her book is written in such an accessible style for non-academics. And there was actually, this is so rare in academia. There was a bidding war for oh, who is going to get her book. 
Hashtag goals. I know. I know. <laughs> such goals. Like everybody wanted to publish her book. And yeah, I, I think it just speaks so compellingly to the moment that we find ourselves in and offers like really interesting solutions to, on the one hand, the fact that a lot of people have really strong emotions and having strong emotions isn't necessarily a bad thing, right? I liked what she said about not tone policing or policing people's emotions. And then on the other hand, wanting to do something with those emotions. And I remember when I was in grad school, the famous philosopher of race, Robert Bernasconi, recommended to me, his, his piece of advice to me was, write angry. And I've always thought about that. But I feel like Maisha also encourages us to act angry, but angry in a very particular way. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, one thing that really stood out for me about her comments about anger here had to do with her use of the term predisposition or disposition. Yeah. Because it made me think about the way in which I experience emotions. And it is true that there are some emotions that I definitely experience, but that, that I don't manifest outwardly. And that might lead people to wrongly infer that I don't feel them because mm. I don't act in ways that might be legible as David is experiencing this emotion at this particular moment. Definitely. And I also think that people's emotions are read differently depending on certain elements of implicit bias, for instance. So a lot of times men's sadness might actually be read as anger rather than sadness because we have this predisposition as a society to assume that the predominant emotion that men feel are angry. And conversely, as a white woman, which has its whole set of stereotypes associated with it, my anger might be less likely to be read as anger and perhaps more likely to be read as like hysteria or I don't know what else like stop nagging <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> no I'm, I'm telling you stop nagging at me <laughs> <laughs> or even just as like there might be more of a predisposition to see it as like polite or like oh she must be responding to something you know that went out of the bounds of polite discourse. I don't know. Now I'm just like making shit up. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny because when I think about my own expressions of anger as a queer person of color, I think sometimes people have difficulty figuring out which category that should be filed under. Because on the one hand, as a queer person, people are like, oh, we can kind of file this under a male form of hysteria, you know, like the queeny gay mm, guy who is like just like bitchy. Bitch, yeah, like bitchy. But then also because I'm a Mexican man they also want to file it sometimes under the macho category and those two things just don't work <laughs> well together so it's like what is this queenie machista anger that i don't know how to reconcile in my head and like of course i don't experience my own anger as a combination of those two categories necessarily but i've seen people struggle Mm -hmm. And I just see the kind of clash in their eyes, <laughs> uh, especially <laughs> along those two identity lines for me. Yeah. And I love how Maisha is just kind of like, look, I don't give a shit about trying to actively contest an angry black woman stereotype from a philosophical perspective. She doesn't spend a lot of time really caring too much about that, right? Because it's like, I'm going to give you a robust philosophical argument for when and why anger is merited and how it often is merited against situations of injustice, especially racism. And so then, hey, you can follow that out to its conclusions, which is that black women's anger is often justified. I also was struck by her claim that sometimes she feels a need not to express anger only yeah. so as to not let people have that uh, <laughs> validation of the stereotype. Yeah, you know, it's like, I'm really pissed, but I won't let you yeah. see it. Totally. Yeah. And, and so my point is not to say that she's like, oh, I just want to express my anger at all times. Because as she said, oh, yeah, yeah. not only does she not want to do that sometimes, but also at other times it would be unsafe to do so or threatening in some way to her person. Um, but I think also just kind of like bypassing that narrative in, in her philosophical writing mm -hmm. um, is a really powerful move. And this makes me think, Ellie, that if we return to Peter Schloterdijk's argument in Rage and Time, that rage is this founding emotion that gets the Western project going, maybe anger, according to Maisha, might be a way to combat many of the side effects that this Western project has produced, like injustice, disenfranchisement, and so on and so forth. So that anger might be the cause of the problem, but it could also be part of the solution. 
We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can find us at overthinkpodcast.com, where you can email us with questions, feedback, or even requests for life advice. You can also find us on Instagram and Twitter at overthink underscore pod. We want to thank our audio editor, Aaron Morgan, as well as our production assistant, Sam Fernandez. Samuel P.K. Smith for the original music and Trevor Ames for our logo. And to our listeners, thanks so much for overthinking with us.